Welcome to lecture four, where we're going to be looking into the flammability of materials and how engineers can understand flammability and find solutions to it. One big context to understanding this is that there is an addiction of humanity to polymers, to plastics. Since plastics were developed um, around the Second World War, the use of plastics by humanity is an exponential growth and it continues. No matter that lately they have a, a bad press. Uh, we use plastics for pretty much everything and our environment, um, we like it or not, has a significant amount of polymers, of plastics. Um, and it means that since the Second World War, um, we have these new materials arriving to our environments, to our offices and homes and industries, which contains changing degrees of polymers, different amounts of polymers and different types of polymers and in different configurations. The issue, one of the issues with polymers is that all of them are flammable. It's just about the degree of flammability. So polymers have a high degree of flammability. They are tremendously flammable, really easy to ignite, and the flame will spread really fast. And some other polymers have a low degree of flammability that is still flammable. They are combustible, uh, but they will express that combustibility in ways that are difficult to ignite. And if they ignite, maybe they will spread very slowly or maybe not even self-sustain themselves. So in this context, we are going to be discussing about what causes this flammability, how to understand it, so we can develop solutions to it. Um, I'll tell you how we can observe the degree of flammability of a polymer. Um, in the drawing, in this sketch that you see over there, we are seeing temperature of, of a polymer as we heat up this polymer. Maybe it's an incoming flame or maybe there's an ignition source that is heating up the polymer and how the polymer starts to heat up as a function of time. And we can consider two materials. In black, we have a base polymer that is highly flammable. We would see that as this polymer starts to heat up, there is a point where it actually starts to degrade and it creates this white um, gaseous vapor. It's actually what is called pyrolysate. Is the hydrocarbons of the polymer have breaking up and they are not longer in the solid phase, they are in the gas phase. And that is a gas that if it's mixed with oxygen is flammable. So the onset of pyrolysis is a critical temperature in a polymer that allows us to know when the hazard starts to develop. Before pyrolysis, the polymer cannot ignite. As, as the polymer continues heating up, the, it accelerates the process of pyrolysis, it's releasing even more flammable gases, and these gases will ignite at some point and a flame will be formed. That is the beginning of ignition. Now we could take this polymer alter its flammability properties. Maybe it's still as comfortable, as soft, as strong, and, and, and as light as the previous one, but this one will be safer. We have reduced its flammability. And you will see this because when we heat it up, it, the onset of pyrolysis still happens, but it happens later on. It means that the polymer has to heat up to a different um, amount of time in order to start releasing flammable gases. And it might still ignite, but it will ignite later on. When, when we have a material that has an onset of pyrolysis that happens later, and a material that happens uh, to hold a flame later by ignition, this material is literally safer than the previous one. It might not be safe enough, uh, that's a discussion that we can have, but it's safer than the previous material. During the process of heating up of a polymer, the process of heating up and undergoing the process of pyrolysis that we discussed, many things happen at the material scale and in the surroundings of this material. Uh, it's a multi-physics process involving as well chemistry, very complex, uh, and actually all these processes might matter. For example, how the heat is arriving, if it's arriving by radiation or if it's arriving by convection because the flame is touching the solid, and how the solid will transfer this heat in depth by conduction. Then uh, this material itself might crack, the surface might crack, which will happen in timber, timber, as it starts to undergo the process of charring, it actually starts to crack. And, and these cracks might also form, all the materials that are not cracking, they might form bubbles, like it happens with PMMA a polymer. They develop little bubbles. That, the, the bubbles process is altering how pyrolysis and heat transfer is happening. Um, all this together and how the pyrolysis gases are released into the atmosphere and they are mixing with the surrounding air, all these multi-physics problems are important in order to understand what is happening. And at the end, all these processes all together express the flammability of the polymer. 
Um, so some of these materials, some of these processes we could neglect. Some of them are important to understand what is happening. In the context of understanding and controlling flammability and complexity of all the process, physically and chemical, that are happening, um, as an engineer, as a scientist, I want to bring a quote for you from Professor Henry Petrosky in the United States. He is a civil engineer and he talks about failure of structures, um, but he is thinking as a scientist, as an engineer. Um, and it relates to the fact that although we might not understand everything that is happening in the process of burning of a polymer, or we might not know how to control the processes, that is not a reason for inaction, quite the opposite. An, an engineer always has to act to bring safety, sometimes with more knowledge, sometimes with less knowledge. So uh, the quote that I'm going to read to you is, uh, you can read it as well over there without the Spanish accent, as Professor Petrosky saying that medical doctors and engineers both welcome all the relevant signs they can master, but neither can wait for complete scientific understanding before acting to save lives or create new life-saving machines. I'm going to show you the result from one of the experiments or tests that is the simplest to understand the flammability of a material. Um, this is an actual experiment that we conducted in the lab. We were given um, a polymer that had a little bit of a, of a foam structure. This polymer was flammable and it was a concern to the developers of the polymer. So they um, Bring, they brought a flame retardant, uh, a natural phosphorus flame retardant that they added into the polymer metrics. And I want to show you uh, this video. We're going to start playing it now, uh, where you can see side by side the two samples. Um, they are about this height, uh, just the side of, of my hand. They are being um, hanging downwards from, the, from a holder. They are in a controlled environment in a chamber. And we are bringing um, a panzer burner, a methane small flame, a pilot, and we attempt to ignite the two of them at the same time. You are seeing the visual image of the two experiments synchronized in time uh, with a slow motion, so you can see what is happening uh, with more clarity. Um, what you can see is that one of the samples, upon being exposed to a flame, it ignites immediately. Uh, so there is an ignition process, uh, which is already a way of measuring flammability, whereas the other one, it, it doesn't really ignite, it just chars, it heats up, it degrades only in the region where the flame has uh, been exposed. The material with lower flammability, with higher flammability, not only it ignites, but actually the flame spreads all over its lens, well beyond the ignition point. That is another way of measuring flammability. Not only it ignites, it actually spreads, and it spreads quite fast. And as the flame has spread, it actually starts to consume the sample, and we can even see dripping. Dripping is when pieces of the material uh, fall down away from the original material, carrying the flame and transporting the flame to different locations. Uh, so that's a triple failure of this material. Not only it ignite, not only the flame spread, but it also drip um, uh, it. Uh, that is an example of a material with a very high degree of flammability. It will be illegal to have this polymer in most places around people. Whereas the treated version of the material, we have decreased its flammability. It heats up less. The, the reaction rate and the chemistry has been altered such that there is no ignition and therefore there is no flame spread and therefore there is no dripping. The second material, although it's of lower flammability, it is still remains a question if it's safe enough. He passed this test, this, this, um, this test that we have uh, with a vertical strip, but there are other tests of different, bar a variety of tests that might look into this differently and we will look into all of them to make sure our material is safe or not. Just because they pass a test doesn't mean automatically the material can be used safely. There are more things that need to be looked at. We've seen just now um, how the flammability of a material at the local scale, at the material scale, is expressed and, and we saw examples and explanations on this. I, In this part I want to show you how the behavior of this material at the material scale, at the smallest scale, um, combines with different elements as time goes by, as the fire grows, and how that actually ends up being the hazard that puts our lives and our property and the environment in danger. I would like to start with this diagram over here that you see. Um, it's a measurement of the heat release rate. The heat release rate is the power of a fire, how much energy, thermal energy, is releasing per unit time uh, as a function of time. When we are burning, we, we are observing the burning of a sofa. 
This is a sofa. Um, it's a sofa from the 80s that was born in the United States. This is data that comes from Nest, a US agency. It's a sofa, a uh, commercial sofa. It was put in an environment uh, where the walls and the ceiling were far away. So this is what we call free burning. And we, we can see how the sofa burns. So we bring the ignition source and we see the fire development. At the beginning, the fire is very small and we can see that it has a, a, an exponential growth. It very quickly starts to grow. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a peak. Uh, that is the maximum expression of power that can come out of the sofa. That's the most scary moment. Okay, In this case, in this sofa, it's a two-seated sofa and the peak happened at about uh, 300 seconds. And it led to a heat release rate, a peak heat release rate of three megawatts, which is a significant amount of thermal energy being released. This was free burning. Okay. After the peak, you see that the fire slowly starts to decay. It becomes smaller. It's still burning. Still dark flames. Still smoke is coming out. But it's not as fast or as large as it was at the peak. And over the course of another 600 seconds or so, the fire becomes smaller and then it leads to this tail, which is what is called the residual stage, residual stage, where there is small flames burning for a significant amount of time. Um, when you are in the residual stage, the, the most scary part has been, um, has, has occurred already. Um, the, the scary part for the fire engineer is the first stage, the growth. The growth is really fast and the, it reaches a very high point. It reaches the point of a, a heat release rate, which is quite large. Fire engineers would be devoted to protect an environment from this growth stage and this big heat release rate. If there were to fail at protecting this, then there would be already a release uh, of, of hazards and dangers to people. And that's what we need to avoid. Um, that is just not how things burn. This is free burning. In reality, what happens uh, most of the, of, the, of, the, of the times is that we have a sofa or a burnable item. It could be a mattress, it could be a, a desk, it could be a computer. Um, whatever it is the item that is burning, it is in a compartment. Uh, there are walls, they're relatively close, and there is um, a ceiling. When that happens, then the dynamics that unleash is what is called the compartment fire. And it's the fact that the flames and the smoke know that they are walls and they interact with the walls. Two things happen, uh, three things happen when, when there is a compartment instead of free burning. The first one is the smoke goes upwards because it's hotter and in the presence of gravity, smoke goes upwards. It hits the ceiling and it starts to accumulate. So then we create, what we observe is that there is a layer of smoke above and there is a layer of free, fresh uh, oxygen or cold oxygen at the bottom. Um, and as the fire develops, the smoke starts to descend. It starts to fill up the compartment from the top downwards and, it's, and the smoke layer starts to descend. This is very important, the descent of the smoke layer, because if there is people inside in the compartment, they would be able to evacuate um, if they are in the fresh oxygen uh, air, fresh air layer. They would in be incapacitated and they would be in danger if they breathe the smoke in the smoke layer. So the descent rate of this smoke is very important for the fire engineer and the fire engineer needs to protect for avoiding the quick descent of the smoke layer and they want to have a smoke layer that is kept away from people that is at the top and it doesn't come down. The velocity of descent of the layer depends on the peak heat release rate or the heat release rate evolution of the item or the items that are burning compared to the volume on the of the enclosure that we have. Another thing that happens is that the, the entrapment, the, the fact that the smoke stays in the compartment, means that there is more heat arriving to the burning element. Instead of the burning element being heated up by its own flames, now what happens is that the smoke, instead of going far away, it stays relatively close and it actually sends heat by convection and radiation to the item itself, which means that items, when they are inside a compartment, they burn faster which means that they lead to faster fires and larger fires, higher heat release rate, than if they were to be outside in the free burning. So the slide that I showed you before of the free burning of a sofa, which is so quite scary in the sense that it was fast, reaching a high peak heat release rate, when it is in a compartment, it actually grows even faster and leads to an even uh, bigger fire because of interaction with the compartment. And the third thing that happens in a compartment is that the oxygen, which is this element that is absolutely essential for the fire triangle. Without oxygen, there will not be fire. 
it is coming through the vents. The vents could be a door that is open or partially open or a window, a window that is open, broken or partially open. And the oxygen will enter into the fresh air layer at the bottom and we meet the fire, provide this oxygen to the fire and the fire will convert it by combining it with fuel into smoke and it will go into the smoke layer. And controlling or impeding the arrival of oxygen by closing vents will make the fire actually not be able to release so much heat. So uh, that is uh, one of the characteristics of compartment fires is that they have a limited amount of ventilation arriving into them and this ventilation is important for the fire to continue. Um, now I'm going to show you this video. This is a very famous video of an experiment, um, a demonstration, more than an experiment, that was conducted in BRE in the UK um, several years ago. It's an old video you can see by the uh, furniture that they use that is from the 70s. I'm going to show you the video now. Click play. Um, this video you can see is under safe conditions. It is a replica. It's not a real living room. It's a replica of a living room. It has sofa, it has desks, it has shelves, it has even decorations on the wall. Um, it has even some toys and pillows. And, and the ignition source, the bridge of the prevention layer, was part of the demonstration. So a professional from BRE just came and, and put an ignition source there. Um, what we are seeing now is the first of the six um, key moments in the development of a fire in a compartment. It is the ignition. There has been ignition, and after the ignition, what we see is the fire is growing. The fire growth is led by flame spread. We can see that there are more flames, the flames are longer, and the flames prefer to propagate initially upwards. That is because of gravity, the smoke is hot and it carries the heat upwards. It means that any surface that is in contact vertically would be the first one to ignite. So we see first that the fire is propagating upwards the seat of the sofa, but as time goes by and the fire starts to grow in size, we will see that it will start to spread laterally as well. The second, uh, the, so the, the first one is ignition, the second one is fire growth. The third one that we see is a smoke filling. As we start to see now that as the camera is, is panning out, that the smoke starts to accumulate at the top of the compartment. This is what we described before, that smoke being hot and being buoyant, it rises up in the presence of gravity and it accumulates in the top part of the compartment. It starts to fill it up. It is like filling the bath, but upside down. And this smoke layer buildup will start to descend um, with the velocity of the fire. The, the fourth element that I want to discuss that you are going to observe as time goes by is that this smoke layer and these bigger flames are transferring energy and heat to the surrounding elements. Some of these surrounding elements are also flammable themselves. So there is going to be at some point what is called secondary ignition, where other elements that are not the sofa, they are not the first item to ignite, other elements that are in the in the room will ignite and will start to contribute to the fire. We're going to see that shortly. You can start to think yourself, which one do you think would be the second element to ignite? Is it going to be the chair? Is it going to be the lamp? Is it going to be the material on the desk? Is it going to be the shelf? What do you think is going to be the second element to ignite? And after the silicon element, you will see very quickly there is a third, there is a fourth, there is a fifth, and there is a cascade of different elements igniting. You can see at this point what we are saying is this white vapor that is coming from the other elements around the sofa. This is the pyrolysis. That gas is flammable, and that gas, when it actually meets uh, the flame, it actually contributes to that. So that was the second element, almost followed by the third, is the lamp in the far corner, was very close to the smoke layer, and heat up and the desk as well. What, is, what we are seeing now that is happening is, is the fifth element of the compartment fire is the flashover. Flashover is a term that firefighters gave to a phenomena that we're seeing, uh, this is a very scary situation, where the fire is at its maximum. It is at its maximum amount of power being released. It is such an amount of energy that everything that could burn inside the compartment is burning. You can see that inferno that was happening um, and actually has run out of oxygen. The, in the compartment and it's actually going outside to meet and find uh, that oxygen. Um, and then after the flashover has happened, whatever the time extra that we have of fire, because the fire brigades are fighting it or um, because we are, uh, for whatever the reasons, the fire continues, that is what's called the post flashover. And the post flashover, which is a very large fire that is still continues burning after it has transitioned to flashover, 
it is the concern, for example, for structural engineers, because it is considered that the post flashover is the worst case scenario for the structure. They consider that the fire growth is short lived and is not of a challenge to the structure. But once there has been flashover, it is a massive challenge to evacuation. Evacuation should have happened well before flashover. It is starts to be a challenge for compartmentation. It is more difficult for the compartment to, to stop the smoke and the fire coming if he has flashover. And it is a challenge to the structure. So this flashover stage is very important. Also for the fire brigade, if they have to suppress, they have to suppress a much larger fire. Um, and is the is the, the the flashover itself is the fifth element that I wanted to discuss with you, and the post flashover will be the sixth. So to summarize, in the history of a, of a fire, and I go back to the slides, these are the six elements that I want to bring your your attention to. We saw the ignition, we saw the fire growth, we saw smoke filling, we saw secondary ignition, we saw flashover, and we saw post flashover. Regarding the post flashover, um, there is Something that happens also with flashover is, as I said, the compartment is running out of oxygen that is arriving through the vents. And what happens is that the flames themselves go through the vents because beyond the vents is where there is more oxygen, more air. Um, this, is, this, is the, this leads to the process of external flaming, which is when the vents, windows or doors of a compartment that has flashover, the flames come out. And they can come out a significant amount horizontally and vertically. And this is an additional hazard because that means that compartmentation from one room to another room or from one building to another building can be breached. External flaming could actually ignite the building in front if the, if the distance is not enough, or it can actually ignite the story above if the flames are coming out through external flaming and start to impinge on a window that breaks or maybe because the facade has a level of flammability. So external flaming that is illustrated in these experiments where after some time, the fire stops burning in the inside and actually comes out, is what happens with flashover. And I want to finish now the discussion of fire dynamics with telling you the key importance of a smoke, um, of avoiding smoke, the importance of avoiding smoke. The smoke is toxic, very toxic. There is not one single fire known to humanity that doesn't have a smoke that is highly toxic. Some smokes are even more toxic than others, but the level of toxicity of the smoke is so out of the chart for toxicology that it is, it is not necessary to discuss which smoke is more toxic. All of them are horrible. Um, it is very important to keep people away from smoke. If there is a big building with a lot of people inside, um, one of the means for fire engineers is to install what is called a smoke ventilation system. The smoke ventilation system is part of the compartmentation layer because it's keeping the smoke away from other locations. Although some people think that smoke ventilation could be part of the suppression because they're, what they're doing is they are suppressing the hazard by taking the smoke away from people and pumping it outside of the building or outside the compartment. So the smoke ventilation systems are a very important part of public buildings, for example, or buildings with offices out of people or the protection of stairs or route of evacuation. And these are fans and, and devices and valves and pipes that will take the smoke and will take it away from this room and pump it outside where there is no, no one um, uh, that could be in danger. This image over here from the Society of Fire Protection's handbook is showing you a large enclosure with different levels, level mezzanines, where different people could be and how a fire at the bottom could actually end up sending a smoke to floors above and there is a need to have a smoke, detec um, a smoke detection and a smoke ventilation system that takes that plume of the smoke caused by the fire at the bottom of the mezzanine um, and is taken away from people while the evacuation is taking place and while suppression is taking place. Um, so with this I'm finished. We are finishing lecture four and this is also the end of the course. So. I hope you've enjoyed it. In this lecture today, lecture four, what we have seen is that understanding flammability is important for the fire engineers to know what they have to face to in order to understand the hazard, to understand the enemy. They have to battle. The fire engineer needs to understand flammability. That flammability itself has different aspects. We've gone through the aspects of material flammability, little pieces of material, how they burn fast or not, and how they combine into the product, that will be the sofa, how they go into the compartment and how they go into the building. And we've seen all the scales that matter to fire engineering and each of them calls for different disciplines and the fire engineer has to put all these scales together 
um, and address the hazard in different ways at different scales. And this is a way of highlighting something that we said already, that it is the fire engineer's duty to protect people from the smoke and from the flames and to protect property from the smoke and from the flames and to protect the environment from the smoke and from the flames. And with this, I finish. Hope you enjoyed the course and see you soon.